Now we're going to talk about how the fission products behave in the fuel salt uh, and how we can potentially extract them from the fuel salt during the operation. Um, so this is a nuclide chart. Of course, we have the elements from the periodic table up the y-axis and we have number of neutrons out the x-axis. And um, there you can see the uranium is up in the uh, top right corner and when it fissions, it creates a lot of energy and then it creates uh, this distribution of fission products. We have the two well-known uh, humps of fission products. Uh, red means there's a lot of it, blue means that there's very little of it. And then we progress the time and we see how these fission products decay away because they're radioactive and, uh, except the blue, uh, black ones in the middle. So as th days and months and weeks go by, they decay into the middle and that's usually beta decay when they decay away from the uh, edges in towards the middle where the stable um, products are. So let's look at some of these decay chains that um, oh, here is an example of a decay chain. Um, so you can see here we start with GE and it um, decays with beta decay through several different decay chains. In this particular decay chain for that isotope the two most popular ones are the two top ones and you can see that eventually it reaches a uh, uh, Krypton, where you can extract it as an off-gas uh, from the fuel salt. Um, but before that, it's it's this for several seconds or minutes or even hours at uh, different uh, elements. Some of these elements might also be possible to take out of the fuel salt, but we will look at that later. Here's another example uh, where iodine decays to xenon, and xenon we can uh, extract, but we have to be fast because uh, the most popular decay chain is the first, the top one, and it's only seen in for 14 seconds half-life. So we have to get it out of the fuel salt fairly quickly after the fission event has occurred. Um, because the next ones, cesium and barium, are very um, difficult to get out of the, of the fuel salt. Here's another one. Uh, it's metallic, so it's not possible to get that one out of the fuel salt, but the good news is that there's very little of this or actually it might be possible to get it out through magnetic uh, separation, but since there's very little in the fuel salt, maybe not needed. Um, here's yet another example uh, where you can get it out as kryptonite, uh, or sorry, krypton, and um, there's uh, 32 seconds uh, in the most popular decay chain. Um, the way we see the popularity is how many, so these uh, indicates how much of the fission products chooses this decay chain and, and here's little and there's very very little on this decay chain. Um, okay, and again we want to get it out as krypton because uh, the next one, rubidium and strontium is uh, very difficult to get out of the salt. Um, yet another one, um, here you have to wait all the way till it gets stable then you can extract it as xenon. Um, you might be able to get it out as tellurium or um, iodine also. Okay, so let, let's look at how the fission uh, products are taken out of the salt. So here we're not looking at the fission products in the salt, but we're looking at the fission product that has been extracted through the, uh, the off-gas separation. Uh, and we can see here that already after, um, and in this case we, we only assume that we can extract xenon and krypton. Um, so after five seconds, we see that we've already extracted a little bit, uh, and after the next, in the next couple of seconds, we should look at the bar charts in the middle of the diagram to see how many percentage of the total amount of fission products we can extract. Uh, so already after 20 seconds, we can extract something like 10% of the fission products um, from the salt with only using xenon and krypton extraction, um, and it's because that. When something becomes xenon, then it decays further uh, to other elements above that through those decay chains. Um, and let's forward it a little bit more till 10 minutes. Uh, already after 10 minutes, um, after the fission event has occurred, uh, we have been able to extract 17% of the fission products by only extracting uh, xenon and krypton in this simulation. Um, and we progress even more up to an hour an hour after the fission event, it's 18%. Um, and let's take one day. So one day after the fission event occurred, 
we have 23% of the fishing product has been extracted and most of those are now stable that's indicated by the green in the bar chart and the yellow in the bar chart the 10% are the fishing products in the off gas that are still radioactive uh, let's look at the chart on the lower right there you can see for each of the elements that are in the off gas tank um, what are the half-life of those uh, not elements but uh, actually the isotopes and you can see that there's a number of different elements and a different isotopes of those uh, with half-lives all the way down from well 10 minutes up to a million years um, okay let's progress the um, the decay a little bit further um, now we move out to yeah three months uh, and now we can see that we have 24% extracted and only 7% um, of this is radioactive and now I'll just fast forward so you can see what happens uh, after let's say 300 years there so after 300 years um, there's very little radioactive um, elements left in the off gas system by now most of this is not gas anymore it has decayed to some um, metal elements so just for the sake of it let's run it out all the way out to a million years and you can see that it almost doesn't change after this it's still two percent when you read a million years um, okay let's look at the next thing so here is a table of uh, different elements and different fluoride um, species that will be available in the fuel salt and we look at the boiling point temperature of those fluorides and we immediately see that there's uh, in addition to xenon and krypton which is of course gases there's quite a few that are gases below the temperature of the fuel salt which if we assume 700 degrees we will see that there's quite a number of elements that can be extracted and because of the vapor pressure we will probably even get a little bit of the next ones extracted as well um, all right but what's really important is that we do not get uh, if you know if it's a uh, flyby salt we do not want beryllium to escape from the salt so we don't want to reach this temperature or even a little below that because of the wave pressure um, and if it runs on plutonium as um, the neutron source for example if you have a reactor starting on uh, spent nuclear fuel like we have in Copenhagen Atomics we definitely don't want to get the plutonium uh, out of the salt uh, and of course we don't want to get you the uranium out or even worse lithium and thorium there's lots of lithium and thorium in the in the salt so but uh, if we assume that the temperature is around 700 degrees we will get these species out so let's look at a simulation of uh, what happens if you extract extract those fission products um, we th we have them here in the in the bar chart or, or sorry in the um, um, in the nuclide chart um, and we see after five seconds already we get lots of stuff out because now we are separating many different uh, elements in this simulation I should say with these simulations that we assume that the salt circulates in the 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 fuel salt uh, circulates the entire amount of fuel salt circulates in 20 seconds for the for one loop and then it circulates again and again and of course uh, the faster you circulate the more you can get out and the slower if you get down to circulations in minutes or you know many minutes like 10 minutes then all the um, elements that has a fast decay you will not be able to extract the reason why we circulate fast is to be able to get those uh, elements that decay uh, within 10 20 30 seconds um, okay let's uh, forward the si simulation uh, already after 20 seconds we have 27 percent of the fission products have been extracted from the fuel salt let's go up to 33 percent there so after half a minute 33 percent that means a third of the fission product has been extracted from the fuel salt this is really important because these are the volatile fission products um, you want to get them out because you you don't want some of those are neutron poisons that they they will um, capture your neutrons through absorption uh, so you don't want that you want to use all your neutrons for fission uh, or transmutation of uh, actinides uh, long-lived long actinides um, 
So you want to get the fish and products out, but also in event of an accident, if the fuel salt is spread um, out, uh, you don't want to have volatile fission products in the fuel salt. So therefore we want to get them out and store them in a safe way. Uh, let's forward this a little bit more up to a few minutes. Already there we have 40% of the fission products being extracted. And let's go up to 10 minutes. Then 44, a little bit more. Now we don't get so much anymore. Um, let's go up to one hour. After one hour we have 46% of the um, fission products being extracted uh, but no, and now we don't get much more but it starts to decay away so after one week we have basically 50% of the fission products being extracted from the fuel salt um, and then only 20% of those are still radioactive and that will continue to decay over the next uh, following days so after 10 years we have 11% that are still radioactive um, and after, let's stop again at 300 years, like that, uh, still have 8% that are radioactive. And those, you can see over here what they are. It's of course the, not the blue colored because there's very little of those, but the red colored, that would be uh, psychonium and uh, cesium that are the main contributors. But there's also a little bit of iodine here. Um, so, they're, they are the main constituents of that uh, radioactive components down here in the uh, off gas. But of course, uh, we assume that um, that this uh, by then, after 300 years, already after um, probably after a week, we will vitify the fission products uh, in glass vitrification uh, so that it becomes uh, very stable. And in case of an accident, it's really really difficult to imagine how it could spread out and harm. Uh, nature or people um, but let's run it up to again um, three million years and you still see that there's still a little bit of um, radioactivity here but not much